that you could experience life. In fact, I'm going to start by quoting uh, 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 somebody who I never thought I would quote on a Sunday morning, everybody. These are the wise words of Dolly Parton. All right, everybody, you ready for this? Write this down, everybody. Don't just make a living, make a life. How many know, okay, Dolly Parton, how many know that's pretty wise for Dolly Parton to say something like that? Don't make just a living, make a life. And this is something that we're going to come back to actually over the course of the summer, how to, how to not just make a living, but make a life. We're going to talk about a lot of life issues and how to live a better life. And as I was thinking about this, I want to show you something found in, in the book of Psalms. This is Psalm 42, verses 1 through 5, that is going to be very common. It's going to be kind of the foundation of what we build on today. It's a very common portion of Scripture. And it says this, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night while, pe while people say to me all day long, where is your God? And I want you to write down, just maybe underline, I should say, these words. I want to point out something to you that maybe nobody's ever pointed out. And it's ver in verse 4, it says, these things I remember. Write that down. These things, or underline that. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. Here's another one to underline. How I used to go, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. And then he asked this question, why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why so downcast, oh, my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Okay, let's stop right there. Here's what's happening in this portion of Scripture. The psalmist is saying, I absolutely long for God. And he ends, well, this portion of Scripture that we read today, he ends this by saying, really by speaking to himself. It would be like me up here today saying, Justin, why are you so sad? Why are you bumming so much? Put your hope in God. He's speaking to himself. Can I tell you something? Some, sometimes you're not going to have a lot of people around you to encourage you. How many know sometimes you just need to encourage yourself? You just got to encourage yourself. And that's what he's doing. He's saying, Justin, put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. Why are you bumming? God is good. And so he's, he's saying, I long for God. I know God is good. And then he says these very unique words. I remember when that joy was just overflowing in my life. I remember that I used to go to the house of God with a heart of praise and a heart of worship. Like I couldn't wait to be there. I longed for it. I longed for the presence of God. I longed for the people of God. I longed for the power of God. I was so happy just to be with God and his people. What happened to me? What happened to me? In, in fact, you, you, could say, you could say it like this. He's realizing in his relationship with God that somewhere along the way, trust has been lost. He, he's saying this. Apparently, I used to trust God more than I trust him now. I used to, let me say it a different way. I used to hope in God more than I'm hoping in God now. How do I know? Well, he's saying, hey, I remember, I used to have this incredible hope in God. I remember, I used to be so filled with joy and so filled with hope. And he looks at himself and says, why are you so downcast? Put your hope in God that something happened along the way where he stopped trusting and hoping in God like he used to. And maybe you're there today. You know, I remember the day that I used to be so happy. I remember the day when I gave my life to Christ and, and the weeks and the months that followed, I was so excited. I, I was just, I was on a roll. And then now you're looking at it like, what, what happened? What, what changed? Let me tell you something. I want you to write this down, that true joy is actually a gauge in your relationship with God. Did you know that? That true joy is a gauge in your relationship with God. With God, meaning you can, you can judge your relationship with God. You can determine your relationship with God based upon the amount of joy that you have in your life. Now, that is not considering the tragic events that we talked about. There's a time for grief. There's a time for tears. 
There is tragedy that comes. There is loss that we experience, and that's okay. But over the course of your life, if you're not inside of one of those tragic events and you're still not filled with joy, that tells you that something is happening. And you might be like the psalmist who says, you know what, I used to hope in God. I used to have trust in God. I used to have joy in God. And somewhere along the way, my full tank has become empty. I was thinking about this. Uh, we, we uh, over the last month, maybe five weeks now, I, I'm at least a month, maybe five weeks. Uh, you, you guys might not know this, but um, we, we took our kids up to uh, Minneapolis. We took Isaiah and Grace up to Minneapolis. We were looking at a, a school there, a Bible college uh, called Bethany Global. And then uh, we came back home. Of course, we, we flew out to California, flew back for a wedding, and then we went on a two and a half week vacation. And that's all happened recently. So in about the past four or five weeks, uh, we, we drove out to Colorado, then Santa Fe, and then just slowly made our way back, and including Minneapolis and all the extra driving we just did, we put about 4,000 miles on our car in a matter of four or five weeks. That's a lot of driving. And, and at $5 a gallon, that was really fun. That was, that was wonderful. When you're filling up your car and it comes to like 80 bucks, that is a riot, isn't it, everybody? And um, how many know that'll steal your joy right there? Okay, so... Uh, and yet, you know how it happens as you're on, if you're on a big road trip, you, you, you stop at a, at, a, at, a, at a gas station and you get gas and then, you, you know, you hit the restrooms while you're there and you might grab a cup of coffee or a fountain soda or whatever. And you get back in the car and, and you're making sure that all your kids are there and, hey, everybody good, everybody good to go. Okay, everybody go to the bathroom. Okay, everybody. All right, let's, let's hit the road again. And as you, go, as you go on the road, you just spend hours just looking at the scenery and you're talking and maybe listening to music. In our world, uh, I'm listening to podcasts and listening to sermons. And, and over the course of, of time, all of a sudden you look down and you realize your, 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 your gas tank, which was full, now isn't full anymore. And you got to stop and get gas again. And, 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 and it just depleted. And have, have, let me ask you this way. Have you ever seen your gas gauge just literally go down as you're driving. Well, if I had a 79 Camaro with two carburetors on it, two Holly double pumpers, and I almost saw that one time, you know what I'm saying? But for the most part, I mean, let's admit it, your gas gauge goes down so slowly that you don't ever really see it going down. You just know it is. You, you don't ever physically say, oh, look, it's, it's just I can see it going down. It moves so slowly, you don't actually see it. But, but after a few hours of driving, you look down, you're like, oh, whoa, hey, we're already at a quarter of a tank. I, I got to start looking for a gas station. And if you're in the middle of Kansas, if you ever make that drive out to California, how many know you got to pay attention to that? Because you're going to go a few miles without a gas station. How many have ever driven through Kansas like that? Yeah, yeah, what fun that is. And uh, uh, so uh, that being said, it's like that in life in, in that you, you get this moment with the Lord and with the Holy Spirit in, in that you're so filled with joy. And before you know it, 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 as time goes by, the gauge changes and it's happening so slow you don't even realize it's changing. You're just living life. You're just driving on the road of life and you don't realize that it's changing, but you look down or maybe even somebody points it out to you. Hey, what's going on? My wife looked at me, this is years ago now, that a very, very serious, dark time in my life. And she looked at me and she said, what, what is wrong with my husband? The, the guy that I married, you're not that guy anymore. You used to be so filled with joy. You're not that guy anymore. What happened? Well, over the course of time, my joy just became depleted because of issues that were happening in my life because of attacks that the enemy had on my life. Everybody, I don't know about you, but I don't want to live a life of despair. I don't want to live a life of, I don't want to live a joyless life. I want to live a life that is abundant, that, that life in Christ that I'm supposed to be living. I want to live life with not only a smile on my face, because people can fake that. I want to live a life with not only a smile on my face, but with true joy in my heart. I want to live that type of life. How many are with me? You just want to live that type of life. Isn't that a great? God put that desire in you. In fact, God only put that desire in you to live a life of joy. He actually called you to it. Jesus said, hey, listen, I want you to live a life of abundance, a life to the 
full. I want you to live that life. And yet here we are at some point having joy. And then over the course of time, the gauge, the true joy gauge has determined that we've lost some along the way. And everybody, I'm here today to allow the Spirit of God to use me so that you leave this place filled up today, everybody. I want you to leave here on a full tank. That's what, I'm, that's what my prayer is today, that you leave on a full tank. And some of you are so depleted, you barely even made it into church today. Can I tell you, Jesus wants to fill you up today with joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Joy that is glorious and inexpressible, another translation says. He wants to fill you up. Are you ready for it? So, so here, here, let me, in, in dealing with this, we actually have to recognize what's, what's sucking the gas out of your life. What's siphoning the gas out of your life? What's, what's taking the joy out of your life? And we need to recognize things because it's not just what God wants to put in you, but it's also what God wants to take out of you, to rid you of, that's actually using up what he wants to to remain in you. And the first one is write these things down. I got 10 of them to give you. I'm going to try to go through them pretty quickly here. There's 10 things, and, and I left you some space off to the side that you can write in some personal notes. But the first one is comparison. Comparison will steal your joy. That joyless living usually includes or often includes a life of comparison. And, and, and that is instead of a life of contentment. Because when you live a life of comparison, you are not living a life of contentment, but actually discontentment. You're actually comparing yourself with what other, with what you have, with what other people have, and you're saying, well, that's not fair, and that's not right, and how come they get this, and I don't have this, and how come they, they, they own that, and they look like that, and they drive that, and they have those amount of kids, and those kids look perfect, and look at their Instagram account. It's so beautiful. It's so perfect. Can I tell you something, everybody? That, that Instagram is as fake as it can be. I'm just being honest with you. I, I don't even look at it anymore. I was so disheartened with people that I know are going through some of the difficult, the most difficult struggles in their life, and they're making it seem like life is grand. Life is great. My family is great. My house is great. My car is great. My job is great. Everything is great. But on the inside, they are absolutely broken. And then we start comparing our lives with others. And then we start wanting to put out this fake persona. Everybody, I, I just got off all that stuff. It was a day of deliverance in the Chambers household, everybody. No, no Facebook, no, no, I don't, I don't look at that stuff. Everybody, whoo, I'm so happy these days, everybody. I'm so, I'm so happy. See, see, comparison will lead you to a life of discontentment. In fact, Comparison breeds discontentment, and if you're not careful, discontentment will actually breed jealousy, where you're just not only discontent with what you don't have in comparison to what they do, but you're jealous. And the Bible says that we are actually called to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Did you know that? That if somebody celebrates the goodness of God, the, great, the greatness of God, the grace of God, that we are actually to celebrate them. And a lot of people, instead of celebrating God's goodness in their life, they end up being jealous over what God did for them and saying, hey, why aren't you doing that for me? And don't I deserve it? And how come they got that? And everybody, can, let me tell you something. That is, if you live that life, you will live a joyless life. We are meant to celebrate with those who are celebrating. That's why, let me give you an example, everybody. When there is a church in Plymouth that I know is just, and this is a Bible-believing church, that I know is just celebrating something significant, maybe it's a milestone of how old they are, or maybe they, they had an event where they, they, they had a bunch of people accept Christ, or it's just something significant inside of that church here in this community. We go out of our way here at New Song to celebrate with them. I send them uh, s s gifts that are not just like, here's a $50 gift card, but I mean gifts that oftentimes are two, three, four, five hundred dollars $500 gifts to say, hey, here at New Song, we're celebrating with those who are celebrating. How many know that churches aren't, churches aren't a competition, everybody? That there's enough people in this community 
that, that needs to be reached with the grace, the good news of Jesus Christ, that it should never be a competition between Bible-believing churches, that we are to bless them, and when they celebrate, celebrate with them. You know, the first day, this meant so much to me, the very first day, I mean the first Sunday, August 22nd, 2004, our very first service ever, the day when only 11 adults and three children showed up. There was another person that walked in that day, and he couldn't stay long, and it was Herb Hyatt from Church of the Heartland, who, who's now retired, but he was the pastor of that church right here in Plymouth, and he came and he introduced himself. He said, brother, I just want to pray with you. And I want you to know there's plenty of people in Plymouth for us to reach for the glory of God. And he prayed with me. How many think that's pretty cool when another pastor does something like that? That's pretty cool. Everybody, don't, don't live your life in comparison. That'll get you nowhere. That'll steal the, the joy of the Lord from you. It is not the will of God. I promise you. Number two, conflicts. And specifically, I'm talking about unresolved conflicts. Unresolved conflicts. The, the, and I'm not going to hang out here too long. But you know how this is. If there is an unresolved conflict in your life, you think about it, and then you think about it, and then you think about it some more, and you analyze it, and you analyze it some more, and all of a sudden it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and it'll steal the joy out of your life. And I'm going to speak a word. Now, I, I'm going I'm to, I've already spoken the word by Dolly Parton, okay? Now, I'm going to speak a word to you from Barney Fife. How many are you ready to receive it? You got to nip it in the bud. How many know that phrase? You got to nip it in the bud. Unresolved conflict, it'll destroy you. It'll steal the joy from you. So if there is a conflict in your life, can I tell you, nip it in the bud. Just get in there and solve it. And if you say, well, pastor, this is pretty big. I need some help. It's one of the reasons we have a counselor on staff here for conflict resolution. Like we're here to help you. We're here to help you. So come and talk to us. But don't live your life with unresolved conflict. It'll, it'll make you miserable, everybody. And I've just learned, just, it's just not a way to live life. The third one, worry. Worry. So, so, so worry, if you're a person of worry, then you're a person of what I would call the what ifs. The what ifs. And if you're, it's like, well, what if this happens? Yeah, but well, what if this happens? And I'm so scared because what if, what if, what if? And if you're not careful, you'll, you'll what if your life away. If you're not careful, you'll what if your life away. So many years ago, my wife and I were having a conversation. You guys have heard this before, and she openly talks about this and teaches it, so I'm not, uh, and she's in Haiti right now anyway, so it's not like she can do anything about it, me talking about it. Uh, and she, she um, See, we're different types of people. I'm always typically the, the optimist, and my wife, she would say, I am not a pessimist. I am a realist. I'm just a realist. And, and I was just always, you know, here and I would always go back and forth and, and usually joking and jest and things like that. But we had some moments, we had some moments in our life that she would, she would use the what ifs. Yeah, but, but what if? But what if? And, and I would turn, to, you know, well, well, what if we lose something? Yeah, but what if we gain something? Well, well, what if it doesn't work? Ah, oh, but what if it does? You see what I mean? Uh, it's just two personalities. I'm, I'm the optimist. She's the realist. And, and I remember the first time that, that uh, can I tell you that, that if, you, if you live a what if life, it'll keep you from the blessings of God because what if people don't ever take steps of faith? They're not risk takers. How many know in a life of faith, sometimes there's going to be a step that God will direct, but you got to start moving. You know, God called, God, there's some people in the Bible that God called and said, hey, go. And they said, where? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you along the way. I, I prepared a land, just go. Oh, okay. How many know that sometimes God just shows you along the way? That he'll direct your path, he'll make that path, but sometimes it's just one step at a time. You don't know what's 10 steps ahead sometimes, it's only one sometimes. And you just take that step of faith. And then God will, take the, God will show you the next step. So you don't know what's 10, ten steps ahead. You just know the next one. And you just walk a life. Well, one, one time in our, in our marriage life, in fact, this is near the very beginning of it, uh, we, we were living in Milwaukee. We had a very expensive apartment that we were uh, living in. Not that we wanted to be in an expensive par apartment, but this is back in, in the year 2000. And uh, 
uh, the, the rent for that apartment at that point, so this is 20 some odd years ago, $819 a month is what we paid. And I remember telling Jennifer, this is not wise. This is not, this is not good. Well, what are we going to do? There's no other safe. All the other apartments, they're not safe in this area. This is the only apartment complex that's actually safe. I said, I know, and that's why we got in there. I said, but if we can find, if we can sublet our apartment, find somebody else to take over our lease. I said, there's some houses in very safe neighborhoods, little pocket neighborhoods that are very safe, that are selling for like 60, 65, $70,000, little Cape Cod, 1950s type of houses. And she said, well, we don't have any money down. I said, you know what? Even if we do 100% financing, it's still going to be less money by a couple of hundred bucks a month than what we're paying now. And we're building equity in that home. So, hey, let's talk about that. And she's like, yeah, but what if it goes bad? And what if the, you know, the, the market doesn't increase? And what if the, the value isn't there? And what if the loan goes? I said, yeah, but what if it does? But what if it does? But what if it does? And we just couldn't come to an agreement, and everybody, and, and uh, I'm, I'm here to tell you that my wife and I, we follow a biblical pattern of marriage, and she said, well, pa she said, Justin, you're, she doesn't call me pastor, trust me, she doesn't. Uh, <laughs> she, said, she said, Justin, you're the head of the house, you're the spiritual head of the house, and if we have a disagreement, I just, I release you to make that choice. And I said, well, I'm going to make a choice that you're not in agreement with. She said, okay, I release you. And, and I, I made the choice. We bought that house. And about six months later, we realized that the market was so hot, we were sitting on a lot of equity in that house. And I told her, you know what? We, we can not only sell this house, but we can buy in a better neighborhood and put 10% down on the next house. And, and so we definitely have, you know, a, a, it's just a step up in, in multiple ways. And she said, okay. And we walked away that day with a big check. And then we got into the next house, and I realized, wow, we have a lot of equity in this house. We could sell this house and make a lot of money. And God had already put it upon our hearts to become debt-free. And, and everybody, God used the, the buying and selling of houses for my wife and I to achieve debt freedom. Isn't that cool? And yet it was a step of faith. She was saying, yeah, but what if it doesn't work? And I was saying, yeah, but what if it does and so I would never use that illustration if she was here because, um, you know, she's not here to defend herself. But, but you know the truth. That's all I'm saying is that's exactly how it happened. And if, she, if you talk to her, she'll tell you the same thing, that there's only been once or twice that her and I have, have disagreed. And in those moments, she's allowed me to make those choices. And by the grace of God, they worked out fine. But, but everybody, don't, don't live your life. Don't live, a life of, don't live a life of the what ifs and worry about everything. Don't do that. That's a terrible way to live life. The number four, I'm not going to hang out here long at all, but materialism, materialism, just always wanting more, just greedy. If you live a life of materialism, you're going to, leave a, you're going to live a, a miserable life. I'm telling you, joy, joyless living includes materialism. The next one, ingratitude, ingratitude. And you think that this might have to do with comparison or discontent and let me, let me actually tell you what, what I'm thinking with this word, so you might want to make, make a note about this. Ingratitude is, is a failure to praise and worship God for his goodness. It's a failure to praise God, to worship God, to honor God for all of the good things that he has done for you, everybody. See, see praise and worship... Praise, praise and worship to God, it's a reminder, it's a way that we're reminding ourselves of the blessings of God and the goodness of God. You're like, well, well, well why has God blessed them more and me less? Can I tell you something, everybody? This is how I, I've just decided to live my life. Now, listen to your pastor. If God does nothing else for me for the rest of my life, and I know he will because he's good and he's faithful, but if he never does I get to spend eternity with my heavenly father because of the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, 
and the salvation that I received through him. If God never does anything else for me, how many know he's still worthy to be praised? He's still worthy to be worshiped. I need to live a life of gratefulness to the one who gave his life for me. If he does nothing else, he saved my eternal life, and he deserves my honor. He deserves my worship. He deserves my praise. He deserves my gratitude. Come on, somebody, amen that right there, because you know it's true. You know it's true. And, and again, I'm talking about living a life of gratitude to God because he's been good to you. You know how I know? Because you're sitting here today and you had breakfast and you had a cup of coffee and you had a bed to sleep in and you had a roof over your head and somehow you made your way here. Most of you, 99% of you were in a car on the way here that you own your own car. Don't tell me God's not been good to you. He's been great to you, and, he, and his greatness and his goodness won't stop now. I promise you that. Number six, unconfessed sin. It'll steal your joy. Unconfessed sin because it's filled with guilt and shame and defeat. And let, let me address this just for a second, that if you want to experience joy in your life, you need to be able to sit across the, the table or across the room from somebody who loves you and who is mature in the Lord, where you can take off the mask and say, this is who I really am. And if you choose the right person, a mature believer, this is what's going to happen. And I have been, I, I have done this actually multiple times. Not only have I taken off the mask, but I've been the guy across from that person. And I'll tell you my response every single time, that the spirit of the Lord just reminds me that this is a God moment. And I look at that person, I say, I am so proud of you. You're, you're proud of me and my sin? Absolutely not. I'm proud of the fact that you came and you took off the mask and you confessed it, and this is proof of repentance. I am so proud of you. God is about to do something amazing in your life. Because see, the power of sin is in its secrecy. I've taught you that. Secret sins are powerful sins. And if you want to destroy the power of sin in your life, you need to sit across from somebody who loves Jesus, who knows the word of God and knows about forgiveness and knows about grace, and you need to take off the mask and say, this is who I really am. And you'll hear these words, I am so proud of you. And you'll not only hear it from them, but you'll hear it from God. He'll speak it to you, and you'll walk away from that moment saying, it was tough, but today I did the right thing. Some of you need to have that moment. The best person that you can have that moment with is your spouse, to tell you the truth. My wife and I are one. There's been multiple times I've taken off the mask in front of my wife, and my wife has taken off her mask in front of me, and we've just ministered to each other. Unconfessed sin, that'll steal your joy. Are you getting anything out of this, everybody? How about this one? This is, this is especially for the ladies. Perfectionism. Perfectionism. Especially for the moms. Moms, you can be so hard on yourself sometimes. You expect yourself to be perfect. And how, I, I, got, I got news for you today. And you're going to hate it at first, and then you're going to love it. There's no such thing as a perfect mom. Let me say it. Let me say, let me step on your toes even more. I promise you, you are not a perfect mom, and you never will be. And I'll also promise you this there's no such thing. Did you know there's also no such thing as a perfect church? Because whenever you and I walk through the doors, it becomes imperfect. Did you know that? If you're looking for the perfect church, you'll never find one because perfect churches don't exist. Churches are filled with imperfect people. How can they be perfect? And, and moms, a lot of times you are so bent on perfectionism, being the perfect mom, being the perfect wife. Can I tell you something? I'm proud of you for trying. But here's a word from the Lord for you. Cut yourself some slack. Pa Pastor, how do you know about this? Be because not only am I a perfectionist, but I'm married a perfectionist. We have two in the household, everybody, me and my wife. 
and I'm not nearly as a perfectionist as my wife is when it comes to parenting. And, I, I, and when it comes to being, I, I can cut myself some slack because I know I'm not perfect. I'm a perfectionist in other areas, if you want to know the truth. But, but my wife, she's a perfectionist. She aims for perfection when it comes to parenting, when it comes to being a wife. And she is so hard on herself. And there have been multiple times, hey, hey moms, listen up. There have been multiple times where my, my wife has been struggling with this. And I, and, I, and I talk to her and say, hey, say, hey, babe, if a lady walks into the office and she says, Jennifer, I just need to meet with you. I, f- I failed. I made a mistake as a wife. I made a mistake as, as a mom. I said, Jennifer, what would you do? She said, well, I put my arm around him and tell him that they're a great mom, that they're a wonderful I said, can you put your arm around yourself and tell yourself the same thing? Can can you show yourself the amount of grace that you would show any other mother in the world? She said, that's pretty tough to do. Yeah. But moms, can you just show yourself some grace? In fact, I just release you to cut, cut yourself some slack. Moms, Show yourself some grace. Tell yourself what you would tell another lady in your place. And, and by the way, this applies to some men in the room too. Not, it's, there's some men in the room that you're too hard on yourself too. You need to cut yourself some slack. And I know because I am one. I'm a perfectionist. I'm goal-oriented. I like to do things the right way. If I can't do it right, I don't want to do it at all. That's the kind of person I am. But God just built me like this. I I don't know why. There's some strengths to it, but there's some weaknesses too. Moms, I'm just here to minister to you today. You're doing a great job. It's not even Mother's Day, and I'm telling you that. How awesome is that, everybody? That's pretty cool. Number eight, overcommitment. Overcommitment. You're just too busy, just too stressed, and you you need to change your schedule. You need to change your priorities because you're just overcommitted. And you know, as soon as I say that, you know who you are. You know who you are. And now it's time to make some changes. And if you say, well, what changes do I make? You need to prioritize. And if you need some some counsel with that, come and talk to us. That's what we're here for. That's what we love to do. And we'll help you. Number nine, pride. Pride. And I I don't mean just thinking that you're you're all that in a bag of chips. I, I don't mean that. I mean living your life being critical of others all the time. Well, look at them. They're wrong or they're wrong. You should have done that and you should have done that. If you live a critical life, can I tell you some of the two things? You're prideful. And the second thing is, you're not going to live a joy-filled life because a critical spirit never produces joy inside of you. You got to let that go. I, I've discovered a long time ago, I'm responsible, a long time ago, I'm responsible for me. And, and here's how I lived my life for many, many years as a pastor. I was answering questions that nobody was asking. Well, then they wouldn't listen to me because they weren't asking. I just gave them my opinion because they were obviously wrong. And so I just gave them my opinion, and then they didn't change. And guess who was frustrated? Not them. Me. See, see that's, that's being critical. That's being prideful. And I learned a long time ago, years ago now, I don't, I don't answer questions people aren't asking. When they ask, I'll answer. Because when they ask, they'll be ready to listen. But if they're not asking, they're not ready to listen. And I got nothing to say. And boy, the joy in my life. <laughs> now that I'm not trying to solve everybody's problems, who aren't asking for help. <laughs> oh, that, that's going to speak to a few people in this room. I would have you raise your hands, but I don't want to, like, oh, you're so critical. I knew it was you the whole time. Get your hand up. I know that's you. Okay, number, number 10, the last one, unbelief. Unbelief. This is how we're going to end it right here, unbelief. Unbelief is questioning God and questioning God's goodness. Questioning God and questioning God's goodness, un- unbelief. Can I tell you something else ab- about this? And I don't know how you would write this down, but it's not only questioning God's goodness, but it's actually oftentimes questioning your own. Now, I know 
that our right, the Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rags. I get it. There, there is no good in us without Jesus Christ. We are left to our sin. I know that. But what I'm saying is some, some of you are thinking, well, if I were a better person, then God would help me. If I were a little bit more perfect, if I were a little bit more refined, then I would see more of the goodness of God. But I'm such a bad person that surely God isn't going to actually do these things for me. Let me tell you something. You don't understand several things. You don't understand the grace of God then, if, the, if that's your thought, life. You don't understand the mercy of God. You don't understand your identity in Christ Jesus, that you are a child of God, an heir of God, and a co-heir with Christ Jesus. You must not, un if you think that God's goodness applies to other people but doesn't apply to you, you don't understand what real grace is all about. And I'm gonna call on you to grow in the Lord. To start studying the grace of God. It'll rock your world, everybody. I promise you, God's grace is bigger than you could ever imagine. I studied it for three years, and it changed my life. I mean, daily for three years, I did nothing but study the grace of God. And it rocked my world. I'm telling you, I'm a better believer because of it. And I understand the goodness of God. Let me, let me show you this to you. This is about Abraham. God made him a promise that he was not only going to have a son, but there are going to be lots of descendants and watch what happens here. Romans chapter 4, verse 19. Without weakening in his, face, in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. So we're talking about double deadness here, everybody. And yet there was a promise that they had not received as of yet. They hadn't seen it. Yet... Abraham did not waver through unbelief. He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded, underline that, fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. Everybody, we need to live a fully persuaded life. Can I tell you something? God never called you to partial per persuasion. He calls us to full persuasion. Let me show you this again. This is in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. It says, For I know, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded, absolutely confidently persuaded, that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. I have a persuasion that is full, that is confident, in the Lord, in the Lord. Let me even break this down to you a little bit more. So, so if you are not fully persuaded in God, then you are living life at a disadvantage. In fact, it is a weakness in your life. Your lack of being fully persuaded steals your joy. It steals your hope. Let, let me say it a different way, that there are two attributes that must be seen in God for us to absolutely know that he will fulfill his promises. There's two attributes, two attributes that we have to see in God, have to know in God in order for us to know that he's going to fulfill his promises, and they are truthfulness, and power. Truthfulness because if God says, hey, I'm going to do it, you need to know that he's actually going to do it. And the Bible says that it is actually impossible for God to lie. So if he promises it, then it's yours in Christ Jesus. Why? Because he's truthful. He's truthful, and you need to know that about God, that he doesn't lie. He's truthful, and not only is he truthful, but he is all-powerful. He's all-powerful. So not only does he want to do it, but he actually has the power to do it. You know, sometimes people ask me questions. Even this morning, somebody asked me a question. I said, I wish I could. I just don't have the power. That, that's not my call to make. Like you're asking something of me, I can't do. How many are grateful that we serve a God who's not only truthful, but he's actually able? 
And you need to be fully persuaded in that, that he loves you and that he's good and he's going to be faithful to his promises. He's going to be faithful to his word. And he's the source of everything that you need, including all joy. Psalm 43, verse 4. There I will go to the altar of God. And watch this. To God, the source of all my joy. If you're looking for anything in this world to satisfy you, it's only temporary. Nothing satisfies you the way that God satisfies you. He is the source of your joy. There is no other source. There is no other source. Can I, let me say it like this. Comparison will not bring you joy. Worry will not bring you joy. Overcommitment will not bring you joy. Perfectionism, trust me, will not bring you joy. I could go on and on, but you get what I'm saying. And yet, over the course of our lives, our tank is on full, and because of those things, we just start losing our joy, losing our joy. And we never start seeing it go down. We just realize at one point, whoa, where's my joy? I used to have it. I remember when. I used to go to the house of God, and I was filled with praise, with honor, with glory for God. I wanted to glorify God and praise him with all. What happened? Where did it go? See, true joy is a gauge in your relationship with God. And we have to live a life that fully trusts in his truthfulness, in his power, and there's a third thing, and in his great love for you. See, this is hard for you to, some of you to comprehend, but God loves you the same amount as he loves me. There's no difference. His love never changes, and it never fails. And he shows no favoritism. That's what the Bible says. There are no favorites in the eyes of God. He's good. He's truthful. He's powerful, and he loves you. And we are going to break a spirit of despair and discouragement in this room this very morning. The Holy Spirit is here right now to do a work inside of you. I'm going to ask you to stand up. This is, this is I, I know we're running a few minutes late here, about 10 minutes past what I really like to be, but this is a God moment. I, I don't want to move forward without giving the Holy Spirit a chance to do something in you that he longs to do in you to help you live the abundant life that Jesus promised. And if you're not living it, if you're not living a life of joy, if your gauge has gone down, today is a day that I'm going to pray, and I don't have the ability to give you joy. You know that, right? I'm not the source of your joy. God is. And I'm praying that every single one of you leave with your tanks full today. And I'm going to ask you, just like as you pull into a, into a gas station, and before you put the gas in, what do you got to do? You got to open up the tank, you know? You got to open up the, the, the gas cap. You got you to take it off. And I'm going to ask you, in the same way, would you open up your hands toward heaven? You're just opening yourself up to receive what the Lord would have for you today. It's just symbolic. You don't have to. It's just symbolic. And I pray, Father, for every person in need of joy in this place. I come against the spirit of despair. I come against the spirit of discouragement and depression in this room. I, I come against all of those things that we talked about today, materialism, perfectionism, overcommitment, comparison, all of those things. Come against those things too. Lord, reveal those things to us so that we could repent of them, that we could walk away from them, and that we would run to you, the, the true source of all joy. And I speak over my church family today a joy that is glorious and inexpressible. Lord, I declare over them today that they would have an understanding 
that you would give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that they would not only know your love for them, but they would know your greatness. They would know your truthfulness. They would know your power. They would know your goodness, your willingness to move in their life, that they would have an understanding that you work all things out for their good. You work all things together for their good. Father, give them the, the understanding of that to know that they can trust you at all times in all things and that you're always there with with them and you're always there for them and we thank you father that you are compassionate and you are kind and you are good in all of your ways your blessings are innumerable lord they, they are incomparable your blessings father are bigger than we could ever deserve that we could ever ask for so you deserve all of our praise you deserve all of our worship god it only belongs to you and to you alone new song could we just lift up our hands in a spirit now of praise and worship and let's just bless the Lord together we bless you for your faithfulness we bless you for all of your blessings we honor you for blessing us the way that you do father we thank you for 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 the fact that we had a bed to sleep in and a, and a roof over our heads and we have food in our stomachs and we have all of your goodness at work in our life and we see it and yet we oftentimes live a life of ingratitude Oftentimes we're not grateful. We don't see what you've, you've done for us because we want things that maybe we, we focus on instead of focusing on you. Sometimes we set, our things on the, uh, we set our eyes on the things of this world instead of setting them on you. But Father, you alone deserve the praise. You alone deserve the glory. You alone deserve our heartfelt worship. You are worthy of it and only you. And we love you, and we count our blessings, and they are plenteous to count. They are plentiful. They are numerous, and you get all of the praise and the glory for it. Store joy to us like we have never known before that we would walk in it. That today we would have a full tank of joy. According to your goodness and your word, your will, we receive it and praise you in the middle of it. In Jesus' name. If you receive that today, say amen. He's so good, everybody. He's so good. We have reason to rejoice. Listen, we got 12 minutes before our next service starts. Your pastor was very bad today, but I don't care. Because it's the house of the Lord. I need you to clear out of here pretty quick, though, all right? Beautiful day. Talk out there, but let's let the, the next service in. God bless you guys.